Uh, one is called Seven Steps to Joy, and there's seven lessons in that one. And then this Victorious Christian Living has uh, five steps to it, and uh, five lessons uh, in that booklet. And this would be a great way to build a relationship with a, a new Christian or a young Christian uh, in the Lord. Now, there's a couple of ways uh, to do some personal evangelism. This one is called The Exchange. It is a four-week Bible study uh, that introduces people to God as a person, that He has likes and dislikes, that He's holy, He's just, He's merciful, and then He's loving. And uh, this goes along, this is the leader's book, and inside the leader's book is a, a copy of the student book. But uh, all of these Bible studies, you work by appointment. So you build a relationship, and then you ask for an appointment and the time and the location, and you write it down in the book, and then you build that relationship. All right, then uh, here's a few fun ways. Uh, these just came in this week uh, to share the gospel. Uh, this one is uh, called the uh, uh, Eye Illusion, uh, which one of these is bigger? And um, then you switch it, and they say, well, I'm not sure which one is bigger. And you switch it back, and on the uh, reverse side of the card is the gospel. So if you would like these, please see me, and I'll get those to you. That's a good one. Uh, another one is uh, a gospel track that looks like a smartphone, and uh, it has humor on there, things you cannot do. Uh, you cannot think two thoughts at once, and you cannot breathe through your nose with your tongue out. Have you tried that? Try it, and you'll find out. So then it says, you just tried number three, all right? And then it skips number five and goes to number six, and so there's a lot of humor in there. All right, this next one is called the Gospel Coin, and on each side of it, it has a part of the, the Gospel message. One side is the Ten Commandments, and then the other side is the Gospels of the Lord Jesus Christ, and so that's a way to, to catch some attention. We are in the Gospel of Mark in a series entitled Jesus Christ, the Servant of Humanity. We're in Mark chapter 12 tonight, and I invite you to turn there. And then just as we get started, I would like to uh, make one other appeal to our local family here in Hollister. Uh, the county uh, has called, and they're asking for resource families. That's what they used to call foster families. But uh, they're needing resource families right now in a pretty desperate way. And so they've called asking, you know, our church, would there be anybody that would be willing to do that? So uh, you can see me. I've got the person's uh, contact information there at the county that you can call if you're interested in getting trained on being a resource family. All right, well, tonight, uh, the title of our message is The Questioning of the Servant. The Questioning of the Servant. Um, it is from Gospel of Mark, chapter 12, verses 13 through 44. Mark, chapter 12, verses 13 through 44. Now, we're not going to try to <clears throat> read through all of this material at one time. But we're just going to break it down in a section at a time. Um, so our proposition tonight is actually found in our beginning verse, uh, verse 13. And uh, it says, They said unto, um, certain of the sent unto him certain of the Pharisees and of the Herodians to catch him in his words. And so the questioning is actually one of hostility, of a hostile unbelief and of tempting the Lord. And so our proposition tonight is do not test or tempt the Lord. And what we mean by the word test or tempt uh, means with hostile unbelief. Now, God is not afraid of one of his children asking him questions. Uh, but we do not approach God in the manner in which the Pharisees, the Sadducees, or the other religious leaders uh, approached him in our text tonight. Uh, we approach him in faith uh, even when we don't know and we're asking him questions. So our first point tonight here is this. The religious leaders questioned the servant about civic and spiritual responsibilities. Let's look at verses 13 through 17. Uh, come on in. Verses 13 through 17. 
uh, we'll see here that they're questioning him about civic and spiritual responsibilities. Verse 14, since we've already read 13, And when they were come, they say unto him, Master, we know that thou art true, and carest for no man. For thou regardest not the person of men, but teachest the, uh, the way of God in truth. Is it lawful to pay tribute to Caesar or not? Shall we give or shall we not give? All right. So Jesus answers uh, them. Uh, beginning in uh, verse 15. But he, knowing their hypocrisy, said unto them, Why tempt ye me? Bring me a penny, that I may see it. And they brought it, and he saith unto them, Whose is this image and superscription? And they said unto him, Caesar's. And Jesus answering said unto them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar, and render unto God the things that are God. And they marveled at him. Now the intent of their questioning was to catch the Lord in a trap. The word here for catch means to take uh, in hunting or to ensnare. So you can see that that's definitely a hostile uh, action. So um, their questions were not simply courtroom questions um, like this one that an attorney uh, made a fool out of himself when he asked the question. Doctor, how many autopsies have you performed on dead people? The doctor answered, all my autopsies are performed on dead people. And so sometimes it's a matter of communicating clearly the question um, so that you uh, are interacting not just with uh, the one who's speaking, but the one who is going to be hearing that you articulate clearly. I've been on the, on the end of that before where I've said things um, without clarity and confused people. But this notice with me <clears throat> in verse 13 is interesting. Uh, you, unless you know the Bible background, this is not of interest to you, and you probably just glossed over it like I did at first. But the Pharisees and the Herodians... Uh, these were two uh, classes of religious leaders that were at odds with one another. They were mortal enemies. But you heard that old adage, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And so here they've come together to be friends against the Lord. So they had little or nothing in common. But now for the convenience of trying to trap, trap Jesus to ensnare him. Uh, they come together, and so we see their hostile intent. Now, um, their fulsome flattery, their opening words, uh, they come out with all of this flowery language uh, to Jesus. Master, we know you're true, and you don't have regard for any man. You certainly teach the way of God in truth. So they're, they're puffing him up uh, in their words, and so uh, this is a buildup actually of sarcasm. Um, but yes, Jesus was a fearless teacher. He did not hesitate to take on the uh, religious leader of the Jewish uh, nation at all. Uh, the Sanhedrin is a ruling class of 70, and we'll see that they're going to ask some class uh, questions tonight. So the Pharisees and the Herodians uh, have a new alliance to ensnare or to trap Jesus. Uh, these men were obviously two-faced, uh, saying, uh, we really know this, but then in hypocrisy, just trying to set Jesus up uh, through flattery. And so this is uh, one of uh, their techniques that they're doing. So they're definitely not honest men at all in the way that they go about the question. And so uh, I guess perhaps by saying, um, do we pay tribute to Caesar or not? They're wondering, Jesus, are you willing to take on the Romans uh, just like you've taken on the religious leadership here in Jerusalem and in the temple? Are you willing even to take on an army of Romans if necessary? And so after their crafty buildup came this lightning stroke. Is it lawful by the Old Testament standard is what they're wanting to know. Uh, that's the law that they're referring to. Is it lawful to give tribute to Caesar or not. And so they have formed their plot against the Lord. They have furthered it by coming together in an alliance and putting Jesus in, a, in an awkward position is what they thought. 
because if Jesus says, yes, it's lawful, then he loses credibility with the people. But then if he says, no, it's not lawful, don't pay Caesar, then uh, he would be in trouble with the Romans. But we'll see not only was this plot formed and uh, furthered against Jesus, but (laughs) we're going to see that Jesus foils their plot. So there's two things underneath this that we see here tonight. We see his answer. First of all, render unto Caesar's the things that are Caesar's. Now, don't you find it significant that Jesus said, hey, do you have a coin here? All right. So sometimes when people are trying to uh, arbitrate a situation, it's like flip a coin for it, you know. Yep, heads, tails. All right. Um, And so Jesus was asking them for a coin. But who possessed the coin? Who had the coin? And so in so doing, Jesus uh, showed that they were recognizing the authority of the Roman emperor. And therefore, were hypocrites in asking the question, because out of a matter of convenience, they were already rendering unto Caesar the things that were Caesar. So Jesus is showing them the hypocrisy. And so Caesar's image, uh, remember Jews were not supposed to have any other image or to worship other images, um, is on the coin. Caesar's image is on the coin, so they uh, are minted in his authority. The fact that you have these coins and use them indicates you think that they are worth something. Therefore, you're already accepting Caesar's authority, or you wouldn't use his money. So, you're hypocrites. Now, uh, Jesus uses a word here that I want us to point out in verse 17. Jesus answering and said unto them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. Uh, it means to pay back, to um, pay off a debt. So Jesus looked on taxes as the responsibility of a citizen. And uh, we have, this verse is uh, used in many different ways uh, within Christian theology. First of all, the separation of church and state. A Christian can render honor to both the state and to God at the same time. So you render to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, but you render to God the things that are God's. And so today uh, we could say that we pay taxes and that these taxes support services. Uh, we certainly do not want to defund the police. So let's fund the police and let's be willing to pay for that to keep them safe on the job and to keep our community safe. And um, so fire protection, national defense, uh, the salaries of, of governing officials, all of these things uh, that it takes to manage the affairs of a state uh, require money. And so here... Um, Jesus is saying, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. You know, the, the government today does uh, many good and helpful and beneficial things in what we call social services. Now, I believe that the church has surrendered too much in this area and that we as a church in our local community, uh, we need to reach out in some way and make a difference in our community. We need to be mindful to do good works. Now, you may not agree with the way that um, the government uses your tax dollars. Uh, But that doesn't mean that you withhold paying that. So you render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's. The authorities that be, the powers that be, are ordained of God. And uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, we pray for all that are in authority. Uh, We pray for the king and governors and, and so forth. And we must recognize that uh, government is set up above us as God's ordained method of protection in a society. And so we render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's. So we may not actually respect the way that someone is using the money, or we may not even respect that person, but we should uh, accept and respect the office that God has created over us. And so then secondly, Jesus not only said, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, but Jesus said, render unto God the things that are God's. Um, We're all in debt to God. And uh, unfortunately, it's not a debt that we can pay. It's not as simple as uh, paying off your religious debts, uh, because only the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ can do that. Um, that He, though he was rich, yet... 
uh, for our sakes he became poor that we might become rich and that's through his wonderful grace that he has given to us now there are certain things that uh, we as children of God are responsible for and uh, remember uh, later on um, Peter needed to pay a temple tax and the Lord uh, told him Peter go go fishing and you're going to catch a fish and inside that fish is going to be a coin and you can pay the temple tax now I don't believe that we're under law in this area of, of giving I believe we're under grace um, and in so doing we must remember we can't actually give more than 10% <laughs> okay? and that surprises a lot of people and so we must live under God's authority as well in the things that we need to be rendered unto God. And so one of those is to render him to him the glory that he is due, as we talked about in our morning series. Now, notice the reaction to the question and the answer, I'm sorry, to the question. So he said, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, to God the things that are God. And it says, and they marveled at him. Uh, what a marvelous answer. But uh, this means they wondered beyond measure um, in t- implying this ongoing, continuing wonder. They couldn't get over the fact that he answered so well. Uh, he completely avoided the trap that they had set for him. They thought it was an airtight case, and the Lord Jesus was able to go beyond that. So we do not need to question the Lord in hostile unbelief. Our second point tonight is found in verses 18 through 27. Uh, The religious leaders question Jesus, or the servant, about eternity. About eternity. Then come unto him the Sadducees. Now notice this is a different group. You had the Pharisees, and then you had the Herodians. And now you have the Sadducees. And and they come unto him, and this is what they believe. So here's uh, an elliptical or parenthetical thought which say there is no resurrection. And then they asked him a question. So these Sadducees, they don't believe uh, in a resurrection. So did you know that there are liberal theologians within Judaism, just as there are liberal theologians within Christianity? Well, they're very liberal, and they're denying that there is a resurrection. And so here is their question. Uh, It takes a while to develop the question, so let's go ahead and, and read this. It says here in verse 19, Master, Moses wrote unto us, um, If a man's brother die and leave his wife behind him, and leave no children, that his brother should take his wife and raise up seed unto his brother, or in his brother's name. Now there were seven brethren, and the first took a wife, died, left no seed. And the second took her and died, neither left he any seed, and the third likewise. And the seven had her and left no seed. Uh, Last of all, the woman died also. In the resurrection, therefore, when they shall rise, whose wife shall she be of them? For the seven had her to wife. Why are you asking a question you don't even believe in? Okay. So they've already made up their mind. This is is just uh, clearly evidence of their prejudice. Um, God does not violate our prejudices. If we don't want to believe, God's not going to force us to believe. And so there are some things in here that show us the serious problem of their heart tonight. Now this is the only place in the Gospel of Mark where the Sadducees are mentioned. They only accepted the five books of Moses, uh, not the rest of the Old Testament, as their authority. So if a doctrine can't be proved from the five books of Moses, then they would not accept it. They did not believe in the existence of the soul, life after death. They did not believe in resurrection, final judgment, angels, or demons. Uh, Most of the Sadducees uh, were very wealthy and of the priestly class. They considered themselves the religious religious aristocrats uh, in Israel. And they looked down upon everybody else. So they brought this hypothetical question to Jesus based on the law of marriage given in Deuteronomy chapter 25, verses 7 through 10. So this woman had a series of seven husbands uh, during her lifetime, all brothers, 
and um, all of whom had died. And so if there is such a thing as a future resurrection, they argued, okay, then she must spend eternity with seven husbands. Unthinkable, okay? So it seemed a perfect argument, as most hypothetical arguments seem to the one presenting them. So let's see how Jesus answers this and um, shows them uh, how far off their hearts are from really knowing the Lord. So the Lord answers this in verse 24, And Jesus answering said unto them, Do ye not therefore err, because you know not the Scriptures, neither the power of God? Okay. Um, So this is a, a very serious accusation. You're greatly mistaken. You're super abundantly ignorant here. Wow, what, a, what an answer to those who think of themselves as having a doctorate in theology. Okay? You're just a bunch of ignorant fools. You're, you're making a mistake. You don't even know your Bible. Okay? And so um, they're uh, thinking that they do this. All right, so let's look here at what Jesus is, is saying to them. Uh, first of all, you don't know the Scriptures neither the power of God. So we're going to look at these two things, the Scriptures and the power of God. They don't know these two things. Then Jesus says in verse 25, For when they shall rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels which are in heaven. Now as touching the dead that they rise, have you not read in the book of Moses how in the bush God spake unto him, saying, I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. Thee therefore do greatly err. So you're not just ignorant, you're really ignorant. You've not just made a mistake, you've made a big mistake. Because you don't know your Bible, and you don't know the power of God. So let's look at the power of God here, first of all, uh, as we go through this. But uh, Jesus is going to end up making a a foolish example out of them. Now, uh, here's a foolish example of another uh, lawyer and doctor interaction in court. The doctor uh, was being sued for malpractice, I guess, for an autopsy. I don't know how can you do something wrong. But the lawyer said, Doctor, before you performed the autopsy, did you check for a pulse? No. No. Did you check for blood pressure? No. Uh, So then, uh, did you check for breathing? No. Um, So it's possible that the patient was alive when you began the autopsy. Absolutely not. Uh, How can you be so sure? Well, because his brain was sitting on my desk in a jar. But the patient uh, still could have been alive nevertheless. Yes, I guess it's possible that he could have been alive and practicing law somewhere, the doctor replied. (laughs) And so I made a fool out of him. And so uh, they make a fool out of themselves uh, in the question that they ask. So they don't know the power of God. Resurrection is um, not the restoration to life as we know it. Um, Resurrection is a resurrection to a whole new kind of life. And uh, so here, uh, Jesus points this out to them. For when they shall rise from the dead, Jesus is not arguing whether there is a resurrection or not. He just states it. There is one. Okay? And uh, I think that's what we need to do in our culture today. Many people just say, well, there isn't a God. Well, there is a God. Okay? And uh, they say, well, there isn't a resurrection. Yes, there is a resurrection because God says so. So Jesus didn't debate it. He just stated it. So when they rise from the dead... They neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels which are in heaven. And so um, one of the things that as a pastor uh, at a funeral, that if I ever uh, have uh, a funeral that I officiate and the family would like an open mic or an open floor for comments, I ask that that goes before the preaching of the Bible. Uh, Because many times I've heard people say, Um, that their loved one has now become an angel. Now, I don't mean to disrespect anybody who's uh, lost a family member and uh, thinks that, okay? But you're wrong, okay? Uh, Your family member did not become an angel. Now, if they know the Lord, 
they became like an angel and the fact that they are genderless and they are sexless and there's no marriage or giving of marriage in heaven. And so uh, the spirits of just men are made perfect and they dwell in heaven above. And so uh, God's children then take on the, the same uh, characteristics uh, that an angel might have. So in our resurrection bodies uh, will be sexless like the angels. So therefore marriage could no longer exist. So she's not going to have seven husbands. Okay? And so in the eternal state uh, where uh, we are then created in the image of God, uh, we will not uh, be concentrating upon our physical bodies per se but rather upon our spirits. There is no death. There's no need for marriage. There's no need for procreation. No need for uh, multiplying and filling the earth. But this is not the only thing that they denied. They didn't just deny uh, the scriptures. And uh, we'll show you that um, they did not know their scriptures because Jesus points it out. And uh, we'll get there in just a moment. But you know, uh, what kind of God do you think that these Sadducees worshipped? They had a poor, puny, little God who really couldn't do much. Uh, he had no power to bring people back from the dead. Now, have you ever heard of this statement, uh, marriage is made in heaven? Okay. Well, Yes, the institution of marriage was made in heaven, but each marriage between a husband and wife comes with a, a do-it-yourself kit, okay? And it is the power of God that puts two sinners together in a marriage covenant where if each is yielded to the, the God and to the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, then they will yield themselves to the authority of the Scripture and their marriage will work out. Now, a God who can create galaxies is not to be stopped by the cold uh, reality of physical death. A God who can make a body out of the dust of the earth, a body so complex that even modern science knows but a few of its mysteries. Uh, do you realize this week they believe they've discovered a new organ in the body? And so it was uh, very fascinating. So it's, it's in the throat, and uh, it has something to do with the, um, the saliva glands. And um, it has the characteristics of an organ. And so they're investigating uh, that system to see if it is a new organ of the body. And it could have implications uh, for the way that they treat certain diseases in the neck and in the head. And uh, so these things are such a mystery to us. God has endowed our bodies with life, intellect, emotions, and will. Gave it a spirit of its own. And uh, so God does not balk at death. Uh, he can raise someone back to life. And so it is not all that remarkable that we should live again, but what really is remarkable is that we should live at all, that we're created. And uh, so the Sadducees were small-minded indeed. And so they did not know the power of God. They did not know the Word of God. And so Jesus points this out in verse 26. He says, have you not read in the book of Moses? All right, so this is going to be the, the five books of the Bible that they do accept as authoritative. Uh, how in the bush, this is Exodus 3.14, God spake unto him, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Uh, the great I am, the self-existent, the self-eternal God. And so uh, he is not uh, saying it this way. He was the God of Abraham. He was the God of Isaac. He was the God of Jacob. He is because Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are in his presence. And so he's not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. Therefore, they are greatly mistaken. Now, I know that they don't accept anything beyond the five books of Moses, but it's there for them. But you know, many people don't believe that there is a resurrection from the dead, and they mock the concept but Job certainly believed it. Daniel certainly believed it. Elijah and Elisa certainly brought people back from the dead. And Ezekiel 37, the whole nation of Israel shall be resurrected one day. So they greatly err not knowing the word of God and the power of God. And so what this is pointing out is you greatly err. The emphasis here is upon you. 
Willful blindness is inexcusable. Rationalism is not a mental problem or a doctrinal problem, but a moral problem. It's not that such people cannot believe, it is that they will not believe. And this is the greatest error that human beings make. I uh, encountered a teenage girl one time in downtown Pleasant Hill as I was sharing the gospel. She says, I certainly cannot believe that. It's not that you cannot believe something, it's that you will not believe something. So do not question the Lord uh, in hostile unbelief. Our third point tonight is verses 28 through 34. The religious leaders questioned the servant about priorities. And one of the scribes came. Now you notice that each one of the points says the religious leadership. And so... Notice you have the Herodians, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and now the scribes are represented. uh, He came, having heard them reasoning together and perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? And Jesus answered him, the first of all of the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment, and the second is like it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other greater commandment than these. And the scribe said unto him, Well, master, thou hast uh, uh, well said the truth, for there is one God, and there is uh, none other but he. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding, with all the soul and with all the strength, and to love his neighbor as himself is more than all the whole of the burnt offerings and sacrifices. And I'm going to stop reading there because we're going to emphasize verse 34. So this next challenger is a scribe. Uh, he, this is probably of the Pharisaical class, okay? Um, but there are 613 laws in the Old Testament. Um, uh, many of them are negative and many of them are positive. Here on my notes anyway, I have 365 negative and uh, 248 positive. And uh, one of their favorite exercises was discussing which one of these 614 was the most important. So our Lord quoted Deuteronomy chapter 6 verses 4 and 5 to them. And so this is known as the Shema. And if you're Jewish, Uh, You obey the law, and on your doorpost of your house, you have a uh, mezuzah, which is like a scroll, a wooden scroll, that's uh, tilted towards the house. And inside that, you've uh, written your own personal copy of Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5, Ashima. Um, And what this has saying, uh, hear, O Israel, uh, God is one. And so you roll that up and you stick that in the scroll and you put that on there. And when you go out of your house in the morning, it's to remind you uh, that you're supposed to obey the Lord from your heart, with your mind, with everything that you have. Uh, Jesus said in in teaching the apostles in uh, Romans chapter 13, verses uh, 8 through 10, that love is the fulfilling of the law. So if we love God, we'll experience His love within, and then we will express that love to other people. And uh, we don't live by rules, but by relationships. The loving uh, relationship to God that enables us to have loving relationships with others. And so the scribe may have been a tool of the Pharisees uh, who were trying to get evidence against Jesus But after he heard our Lord's answer, the scribe stood and uh, dared to commend the Lord for his reply. Now, there was a senator um, this last week that was of an opposition viewpoint than the Supreme Court nominee, and uh, she's from California, and she dared to compliment the judge upon her answers, and she took the wrath of her own party for doing that. And so this man may have been the same kind of situation to face the wrath of his party for complimenting the Lord upon his answer. But notice what the Lord says to him in verse 34. And when Jesus saw that he answered discreetly, he said unto him, Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. All right. So what does it mean when a person is not far from the kingdom of God? 
Well, we see that he answers discreetly, or he's answering honestly or transparently. And um, he's not interested in defending the party line. So he may have gone at first to be a party representative, but then he's standing there before the Lord Jesus as an individual. And as an individual, he compliments Jesus on his answer. And Jesus says, well, you're not far from the kingdom of God. And so uh, by this... um, It means the person uh, is testing his or her faith by what the Word of God says and not by what some religious group demands of them. And so he needed then to reject the party and to receive Jesus as his Savior. And that's where he would enter into the kingdom by not trusting uh, his religious viewpoint, but trusting Jesus Christ as his Savior. And um, so here, once again, we see... uh, the start of this, a hostile intent. Um, you know, it, it's a theological arguments, and people argue theologically all the time. And so they're trying to trap him, trying to ensnare him. So let's not question the Lord in hostile unbelief. And in closing tonight, then let's look at how the servant questioned the religious leaders, beginning in verse 35. And Jesus answered and said, um, while well, he taught in the temple, How say the scribes that the Christ is the son of David? For David himself said by the Holy Ghost, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. David therefore himself calleth him Lord. And whence is he then his son? And the common people heard him gladly. And he said unto them in his doctrine, Beware of the scribes which love to go in long clothing and love salutations in the marketplaces and the chief seats in the synagogue and the uppermost rooms at the feasts, which devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers, these shall receive a greater damnation. Okay? So think about some of the questions that they've asked tonight. Questions about eternity. Questions about civil and religious obligations. So they mean these are important questions. Um, they asked which is the most important commandment of all. Um, And Jesus answered that, and that is truly the most important commandment. But here's the greatest question. The most important question that you can ever answer is, who is the Christ? Who is Jesus? Who is this person? So Jesus takes the Old Testament, and he says, Now David, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, wrote in the Scripture that his son is his Lord. How can this be? How can he be David's Lord and David's son at the same time? How is that possible? And so the common people thought, wow, this is great. Um, But this stumped the religious leaders, and so he's asking them this question. And uh, so this is the question that he asks. Um, But if we're wrong on this answer, then we're wrong about Jesus Christ. We're wrong about salvation. This means that we end up condemning our own souls to a Christless eternity. Yes, folks, that's right. We go to hell if we get this wrong. Um, John chapter 3, verse 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Um, Then John 3, 36, uh, But the wrath of God abides upon those that believe not. And so we must answer this question not only just intellectually correctly, but correctly from our affections and from our volition, from our will. So his question led then to a warning. Uh, We see this here. Um, Beware of the scribes. All right. So he said in his doctrine. So this is his authoritative teaching. Jesus tells you to beware of people who make long prayers Um, They go around wearing uh, religious clothing. They love the salutations in the marketplace. Hello, Dr. So-and-so. How are you today? Oh, look at that. It's uh, so-and-so. Very scholarly. And uh, caught up in the prestige and the pride of life. Jesus says, beware of religious people who are caught up in the pride of their life. Um, And desire to be recognized and have the prominent places and, uh, but notice their character in verse 40, which devour widows' houses. That's their real character. So beware of them. And so these are the two warnings 
that the Lord gives against the pride of the scribes and against the pride of the rich. So if we're important, it's not because of the uniform that we wear, or the title that we have, or the office that we may have. Uh, it is the character that makes one valuable. Nobody can give you character. You have to develop it as you walk with God. Now, his question led to an observation, and so here's our closing slide then tonight. Um, Jesus sat over against the treasury, and behold how the people cast money into the treasury, and many that were rich cast in much. And there came a certain poor widow, and she threw in two mites, which make a farthing. And he called unto him his disciples, and saith unto them, Verily I say unto you, that this poor widow hath cast in more than all they which have cast into the treasury. For they did cast in out of their abundance, but she of her want did cast in all that she had, even all her living. Now, um, it is believed that around the temple courtyard there were 13 uh, offering boxes uh, where the people could put in their treasures. And the rich made quite the show or the spectacle of this. Hey, everybody, I'm about to give a big donation. Can you watch? You know, clank, 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 clank. And um, so they're trying to draw attention to what they're doing. Okay. And so they were giving much. Now, uh, does God like people to be generous in their giving? Absolutely, all right? So he's not saying they should have given less. That's not the point of the passage. But they had so much that they could give, and it wasn't a burden to them at all. Now the widow comes along, and she gives all that she has, and this will leave her absolutely destitute. She gives her last few pennies away to God, and that's all she has. And so Jesus says of her, and this is a, a, an eternal memorial in the scriptures, that um, she, because of her want, did cast in all that she had. Uh, her offering uh, was everything she had, and it was going to leave her in a position of need. What if rich people gave like that? Okay? God would be glorified. And so it was all her living, he says. So the idea here is this. It is not the um, amount or the portion that you give, but the proportion that is important. And so the rich gave out of their abundance, but the poor widow gave all that she had. The, for the rich, their gifts were really a small contribution because they could, all right? They were wealthy. But for the widow, her gift was of true consecration. It was her whole life because her life would hang in the balance after giving of her offering. So the pride of living and the pride of giving are sins that we must avoid at all costs. Now how tragic that the leaders here uh, were questioning the Lord tonight. They depended upon their religious system and were trying to defend it technically before the true and the living God. How wonderful that the common people gladly listened to Jesus and obeyed his word. I have a question for you. Which group are you in tonight? Don't place your faith in religion, but in Christ. Don't question the Lord Jesus in hostile unbelief. To know the Lord is a very simple thing. A, acknowledge that you're a sinner and cannot save yourself. B, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And C, call upon his name, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Well, thank you for being with us tonight. Please remember to like, comment, and share. And uh, let's go ahead and close with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the evening that you've given to us. Thank you for uh, the wisdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. May we never lose the wonder of Jesus Christ, who is God all wise. Thank you that uh, he had a heart for people, uh, Lord, that he gave an eternal uh, word of commendation to this widow who gave her all. Thank you for the teaching about the power of God that he gives us hope when we face the death of a loved one. Thank you for the accuracy and the authority of the scriptures 
that we can find you in the Old Testament and find you in the New Testament. Thank you that you were that prophet that was to come and that you're greater than even Moses, that you are um, not just the son of David, but that you are David's Lord. And may we believe in you tonight. We ask these things now in Jesus' name. Amen.